Hi, my name is Laurie Massimo, and I'm going to be talking about decision making in advanced illness. So in order for you as caregivers to make effective decisions on behalf of your loved one with frontotemporal degeneration, we need to think about the natural history of the disease and common issues that can arise around the end of life. So I'm first going to talk about what happens in each stage of the disease. Next, I'm going to spend some time talking about common complications that can arise in advanced illness, including difficulty with mobility, problems with incontinence, and difficulty swallowing. Next, I'm going to cover things that you can do as caregivers to reduce complication and improve quality of life for your loved one with advanced FTD. And lastly, I'm going to talk about some medical decisions that you may have to make as the disease progresses. So oftentimes uh, I get asked the question, what stage is my loved one in? And we can think of the disease in four stages. And these stages are defined by how much the person with FTD relies on their loved one for their activities of daily living. Things like eating and bathing and dressing. And you can see here that the mild stage is the longest stage. And that's because there are compensatory mechanisms that enable the person with FTD to be relatively independent. As we move through the stages of the disease, each stage is shorter than the last, with the affected person requiring more and more assistance from their caregiver. Now I wanna briefly describe what you may see in each stage. In the mild stage, there are subtle changes that are typically restricted to the domain of difficulty that brought the patient into the doctor's office. For example, there may be difficulty with performing tasks at work. At home, you may see um, more complex activities like paying bills and managing checkbooks are problematic. In the moderate stage, activities now become more of a collaborative effort. So you may notice that your loved one needs prompting through activities. You may have to supervise dressing. You may have to lay out your loved one's clothes at this point. Here, we can also see different symptoms emerge. In this stage, we may, may see someone with primary progressive aphasia who had primary language problems now develop a rigid personality or compulsive behaviors. In the severe stage, the person with FTD needs hands-on help to complete activities, like assistance getting arms in the sleeve and helps help with buttons. And here is often where we see incontinence emerge. And oftentimes the person is bedbound and unable to walk without assistance. And here's a visualization of the goals of care um, that you can see change throughout the disease course. And we may also see here that more than one goal may apply. For example, in the mild stage, the goals are to prolong life and maintain function. In the moderate stage, our goals are to main, maintain function and maximize comfort. And in the severe stage, the primary goal is really about comfort. And this is what we're going to spend a lot of time talking about, thinking about ways to promote comfort and quality of life. So we know that FTD is a life-limiting illness, and the progression is uncertain and varies greatly between individuals. The duration of disease is anywhere between 2 to 15 years. And in our center data, the average is around 86 months, which is a little over 7 years from symptom onset or the time when you first notice symptoms. As I mentioned, there's a broad range for life expectancy, and research has demonstrated there are certain factors that may contribute to a more rapid or a more prolonged course. These include genetic factors. For example, work out of our center by Dr. McMillan shows that there are genetic variations that can explain some of the variability that we see in survival time in FTD. We also know that lifestyle factors um, like cognitive activity that you acquire over the course of your lifetime through your education or your job may be protective. And we think that this type of cognitive stimulation may help an individual to develop cognitive strategies and neural connections in the brain that can be especially helpful, helpful for compensation early in the stage of the early in the uh, early phase of the disease. Physical exercise is another factor that has also been associated with a slower rate of cognitive decline. Even 20 minutes of activity a day, such as walking, is important to continue through the disease course. But we want to make sure that it's done safely. So now I want to turn to thinking about strategies to maintain mobility. 
many people with FTD, unfortunately, gradually lose their ability to walk. And so we can see complications arise like pressure ulcers, falls, constipation, and blood clots. Some things that we recommend include a visit by a physical therapist and occupational therapist who can give advice about equipment like walkers to aid mobility. They can also teach families about range of motion exercises, which is a gentle stretching um, that can help maintain joint mobility and reduce painful contractures, which is a stiffening of the muscles and joints. It's also important to think about frequent repositioning of the patient to prevent painful pressure ulcers. You may also want to consider altering the bed surface or the wheelchair surface by adding cushioning, such as foam pads. Many people uh, lose, their, lose control of their bowel and bladder in the advanced stages of FTD. So things to keep in mind include avoiding caffeine and diuretics, such as um, in tea and coffee and alcohol. Uh, this may be helpful in reducing the frequency of incontinence. Because individuals with FTD don't recognize the need to go to the bathroom, it may be up to you to watch for signs that they need to avoid. So you might want to consider a toileting schedule that's guided by the clock or setting a timer to remind the person to get up to use the bathroom. Now, there are a number of reasons why someone with FTD could become incontinent. One common cause is a urinary tract infection. Some signs that may be indicative of a urinary tract infection include urine that appears cloudy or strong smelling urine. But there may not be a change in the urine, and so the warning sign may be an abrupt change in behavior, such as severe lethargy or abrupt agitation, increased confusion. If you see these signs, it's really important to talk to your medical team so that they can order a urine specimen to check for a urinary tract infection. The mechanisms of chewing and swallowing can become compromised in advanced illness, and as a result, the person with FTD may be at risk for food or drink entering their lungs, and sometimes an aspiration pneumonia may occur as a result. Some things that you can do to promote a safe swallow include sitting your loved one fully upright during meals and maintaining a neutral head position. You wanna think about limiting distraction during the mealtime so that your loved one can focus on their swallow. Oftentimes, reduced appetite and weight loss can be a problem in advanced stage FTD. So providing small frequent meals that are high in calories, especially in protein, can help to meet nutritional requirements. Consider changing the consistency of the food, such as um, to mechanically ground foods or pureed foods, things like applesauce and, and thickened liquids to a smoothie consistency can help with someone who's having difficulty swallowing. These foods are also advantageous for individuals who are hyperoral because it can slow the swallow down. And lastly, pills can be really difficult to swallow. So do ask your pharmacist if the medications can be crushed or perhaps there's a liquid form available. Now, discussing swallowing difficulty naturally leads to the consideration of feeding tubes, which is one of the hardest decisions that caregivers may have to make at the end of life. Many caregivers expressed concern that they feel like they're starving their loved one, but it's important to keep in mind that it's common for individuals to lose their sense of hunger and thirst in advanced illness. Now, when there's motor difficulty early on in the condition, such as with ALS, sometimes feeding tubes are considered, but otherwise there's limited data to support the use of artificial nutrition. In fact, patients can still aspirate their saliva and there's no difference in survival between those with feeding tubes and those without. And unfortunately, we see complications can arise in individuals with feeding tubes, such as agitation, infection around the sur surgical site where the feeding tube was inserted and diarrhea from the highly concentrated formula. Now that um, we've talked about improving quality of life for your loved ones, let's turn to you. Through all of this, you have to think about you. And respite services can be a positive self-care decision. Respite is a short time of rest or relief. It provides a break from the typical, the typical care routine, allowing the caregiver some downtime while the person with FTD is still cared for. Respite can be delivered from paid staff, volunteers, family, or friends. It can be provided in your home or in a residential care facility in the form of a short-term stay. It can be used as a regular support 
or it can be used on an occasional basis. And this brings up the whole question of where to best care for your loved one throughout their illness. The decision about how to best care for your loved one with FTD is a difficult one and really requires an honest evaluation of your resources and support. People with FTD need a safe, structured environment. And if your home isn't set up in this kind of way, then you may need to consider remodeling to provide better access in the bathroom or a bedroom on the first floor. If you're caring for your loved one in the home, uh, and they are ambulatory but require a high level of supervision, an adult day center may be a good choice. For individuals with advanced FTD who require increased levels of care, it may be difficult for one caregiver to provide, so you may need to find a home health aide or a nurse to help with care activities. Now, long-term care facilities are another option to consider, and there are several kinds of long-term care facilities. Each provides a different level of medical, medical care, personal assistance, and support services. For example, assisted living facilities usually provide private, apartment-style living and offer a limited services such as housekeeping. This type of facility is probably more appropriate for someone with mild stage disease. Nursing homes are another type of long-term care facility that provides skilled care, such as assistance with feeding and bathing, and all of the resources are on site and provided by trained personnel. So in the next two slides, I wanna talk about, talk about palliative care and hospice. Palliative care can be thought of as a spectrum of care that can start in the early stages of the disease and can continue through um, when the illness progresses. It can happen concurrently with treatment. And the focus is on maintaining function and maximizing quality of life. Here are a few ways that palliative care can be useful. In the early stages of the illness, palliative care can be used to educate and support patients and families around what the diagnosis means and what to anticipate as the illness progresses. Palliative care can be useful in helping patients and families facilitate the discussion about, about advanced care goals and about important issues that we've talked about like feeding tubes. Pain is sometimes an issue early on, especially in conditions like corticobasal degeneration or progressive supranuclear palsy. Palliative care clinicians are trained in evaluating and managing pain. And sometimes difficult behaviors arise, such as aggressive behavior and agitation. There may be depression and sleep problems, and palliative care clinicians are trained in managing these difficult behaviors. Hospice care is appropriate when the primary goal of care is about maintaining comfort and the life expectancy is about six months or less. Now we realize that this is really hard to determine. And in some cases, patients need to be recertified after six months so that they can remain on hospice longer. Hospice specializes in holistic care that is physical, spiritual, emotional, and it's provided by an interdisciplinary team often made up of doctors and nurses, home health aides, social workers, chaplains, and counselors. Hospice can be provided in the home or um, in a specialized hospice facility and even in the nursing home setting. Hospice provides medications, medical equipment, respite services, support and education, and is paid for by Medicare and commercial health insurance. Another decision that you may have to consider is brain donation. This is typically set up in advance of the time of death. And the procedure is done in a way that is sen sensitive to cultural burial practices. The benefits of brain donation include the identification of the etiology or the cause of the illness, which may have genetic implications. As you heard earlier um, in the talks by um, Dr. Grossman and by Dr. Irwin, the only way to make a definitive diagnosis is by direct examination of the brain. In our center, families are given a complete neuropathological report and a discussion is had with our families about the findings and their implications. And lastly, much of our knowledge about the proteins and the genetic mutations, and even the treatments that are being developed stem from our brain donation program. So it really has a, uh, helped to advance the science tremendously. So advanced care planning means thinking about, discussing and um, making decisions about care. There are many important discussions about end-of-life care that are best started during the mild stage of the illness. So we encourage early conversations about goals of care. Common decisions that may need to be made include 
uh, feeding tubes, hospitalization, CPR, and whether to continue to pursue diagnostic and screening tests such as colonoscopies. All too often decisions about life-sustaining treatments are presented in a time of health crisis, and therefore these are times of great stress for caregivers. If you can, have these conversations early on with your loved one about their values and their preferences. Having these conversations early on with your loved one and your family will help you to be more confident as you have to make these decisions. And as always, inform your medical team of your preferences. So to conclude, care priorities shift to comfort and advanced qual and quality of life in advanced FTD. You want to try to make these decisions early on about your care goals, but know that it's never too late. And know that there are resources to support you. Thanks so much.